This evening we're continuing our study in the book of Daniel and we're turning to Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. Now, just to remind you, um, God gave uh, Daniel, uh, Nebuchadnezzar actually, a dream and then he gave him a second dream many, many years later, maybe uh, as many as 30 something years later. And this is what we're dealing with here in chapter 4. This dream had to do with uh, a dream he saw a a tree and it was so huge and great and uh, he was really impressed by it and everything. And then, of course, he couldn't understand it and then what else uh, was in the dream. And so he he called all of his uh, wise men and Uh, all of his Chaldeans and all those fellows, and uh, they came and they couldn't tell the interpretation. You know, you would think that all those years that uh, he had really the privilege of having Daniel there with him by his side, really, as far as we can tell, uh, and uh, had seen the wisdom, he had seen how God had led and guided Daniel and everything, and, of course, how he had interpreted the, the other dream, even being able to tell him what the dream was, uh, that, that he would have just called Daniel. And, uh, but I guess maybe because he's paying all these other fellows, he might as well see if he can get his money's worth. And so he calls them, and they come, and they scratch their heads, and they have no idea what the dream means. And the Bible, interestingly, says, and then came in Daniel. So... We don't know, was Daniel just delayed for some reason? Uh, Did God have Daniel kind of hold back? Uh, He was uh, really in charge of all of these fellows uh, and uh, maybe, you know, sent them along or uh, we don't know. But the Bible says then Daniel came and uh, the king, I can just imagine his face lighting up after having to listen to all these fellows say, I don't know, I have no idea. And then Daniel comes. And Daniel gives him the interpretation of the dream. Uh, He tells him that the tree represents him, Nebuchadnezzar. And he was great. And uh, over all these kingdoms and uh, the beasts and the birds represented all the people who were under his care. But then the Bible says that that tree was cut down. The only thing that was left was the stump. And Daniel had to tell him that not only are you the tree, but you will be cut down. And that he would spend seven years living like a beast, but that he would be restored. And so here we are. uh, All of these things have taken place. And we come to that place now in Daniel chapter 4, where he now has been restored. And so, if you will, stand as we read God's precious word this evening. We're going to begin with verse 34. Verse 34. And uh, then we'll be reading uh, to the end of the chapter. Now, at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored Him who lives forever. For His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and His kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to His will in the army of heaven, And among the, (coughs) excuse me, (coughs) excuse me, among the inhabitants of the earth, no one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles resorted to me. I was restored to my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice. 
and those who walk in pride he is able to put down. Heavenly Father, we do ask thee to bless the reading of thy precious and wonderful word and the preaching and teaching of the word of God. Much here, the testimony of a pagan king that you change his heart. And we praise you and thank you for that. And we thank you for this portion <clears throat> in the book of Daniel that you had Daniel uh, insert here for our instruction, uh, for our encouragement. Uh, for us to uh, just be able to see what you do in the hearts of the lost as you did in our hearts. We pray your richest blessing this evening on the preaching and teaching of the word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. For seven long years, King Nebuchadnezzar lived the life of a beast. His nails grew long like claws. His hair uh, grew long. His meals consisted of grass, and he lost his mind. I remember, I think you remember that I told you in those days, uh, somebody who lost their mind was not put in an institution. Uh, they looked at them as uh, somebody who was kind of special. Uh, they would be frightened of them, but they would, uh, they would still have this feeling that somehow the gods were involved in, in uh, what was happening. And so you can imagine uh, all of these people around him uh, how all of a sudden, I mean, and it was sudden that he just went wild. And uh, so we don't know where he was located during this time. It could have been on the grounds of the palace. We realized that the palace was a huge area. We shared that with you last time. And so it could have been there. Maybe the rest of the people didn't even see what was going on. Maybe they did. But it's so interesting that Nebuchadnezzar actually writes this whole chapter really is his reporting to his whole empire what God had done in his life. That's an incredible thing. Now, as God had promised, Nebuchadnezzar would eventually be delivered from his affliction and restored to his sanity and his normal life. The king himself described three steps that led him uh, <clears throat> to his restoration. Look with me, and we're going to go back to it, but look with me at verse 34 for a moment. Nebuchadnezzar writes, And at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. And so he recognized that the God of the Hebrews, the God of the Jewish people, was an eternal God who honored, who was to be honored and to be praised. He went on to recognize that God's kingdom was forever. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom was limited, but he recognizes here that God's kingdom has no end. It's an eternal kingdom. That's an incredible thing when you think about it. One, because these guys usually thought their kingdoms would go on forever, and he comes to the place and says, oh, wait a minute, I know mine doesn't, but I know that there is a God in heaven whose kingdom will go on forever. Nothing can, go, can, can destroy God's kingdom or defeat his purpose. He goes on and he says, For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. The second thing that the king did was to recognize the sovereignty of God. 
Verse 35 says, And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, What have you done? And this was really the main lesson that God was teaching uh, to Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, remember, this is, a, this is a king who inherits the empire from his dad. He started off as the general of the army. He was very successful. He did an incredible job for his dad. In the middle of his time in conquering Israel, his father died. He's called back to Babylon, and, uh, and others take over, and he becomes the king. He becomes the emperor. Uh, but he goes on far beyond just uh, Babylon, but he begins to conquer nations all around, not just Israel. Uh, and so he, he spends a number, a number of years doing this. Finally, he has amassed this great empire, and then he kind of settles down and he begins uh, to build Babylon. And he does a magnificent job. He builds this city it becomes uh, really one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Uh, and so he, uh, he's a very proud man. Uh, he's a man who, let's face it, with all that has happened, all that he has around him, he thinks, man, I'm it. I'm it. I'm, I've, I've, I've done everything. There's no one like me. And God needed to come in alongside him and say, you know, fella, you're not. You're not it at all. Um, and so this is his main lesson. Notice what he says here. He says that all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He says, we're nothing. That's an amazing statement coming from him, but it's a statement that all of us have to really admit. We are nothing when we compare ourselves to God. God does whatever he wants. Why? Because he is God. Now, I, I think it's really too bad that the wonderful biblical doctrine of the sovereignty of God is misaligned and, and, and misinterpreted by many. Uh, an understanding of God's sovereignty brings really uh, to believers uh, an assurance, uh, a strength, comfort, the kind of surrender that produces faith and freedom. When we realize that God is sovereign, that he is the King of kings and Lord of lords, and that we are to come under him totally and completely, not just somewhat. You know, God is, is being uh, shrunk down, if I could put it that way today. God is being looked at less and less as if he's God. He's almost becoming... Uh, to, to the world just uh, uh, a, a temporary thing. You know, a lot of the world looks at us and they say, I don't need that. I, I don't need a God. Uh, I, I'm, you know, they may not say I'm my own God, but that's really what they're thinking. And, and so we see this man here who has been higher than any of us and had more power and more success and, and more glory and as far as the world is concerned. And he is saying, listen, I'm nothing. He's saying none of us are anything when we compare ourselves to God. The Bible teaches both the divine sovereignty and human responsibility. And we have to accept both. There are biblical truths that run side by side. In our minds, we kind of either want to say, oh, we're, it's either this or it's that. Because it's hard for us to comprehend that two truths can be like railroad tracks and they go side, side by side and they work together. Uh, that's not how we think. That's not how our minds work. But that's what the Bible teaches us. 
There's no contradiction. There's no conflict. It just looks like conflict to us. But if you take the Word of God for what it says and accept it, then you, you're not going to have any trouble. Sometimes you can't understand something, but you accept it because it's God's truth. You know, I've, I've shared with people over the years, and you know, I had the privilege uh, when I was in the Army of, of uh, studying electronics and electricity and all those things, and I still don't understand it. Uh, I, I tell you, when I was in class in Fort Bliss, Texas, in, in the morning, we, we were in class and there was all this stuff on the board and everything, and I, I was totally confused. And, and they're going through all of this stuff and it just didn't make sense to me. But then in the afternoon, we went downstairs in, and we had a lab there. And you had to put resistors and capacitors and, 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 and put wires together and all this stuff. And every once in a while, you would get shocked. <gasps> I understood that. <laughs> that made all the sense in the world to me. So, oh yeah, okay. And, and so the, the truth of the matter is that I, I still don't understand all the stuff about what I learned. I'm, I'm, you know, isn't that great? I, I worked on Nike Hercules missiles and didn't have the slightest idea what I was doing. Eh? Aren't, you, <laughs> aren't you encouraged? <laughs> It's probably why they removed them from the headlands up there, except I wasn't working on those up there. But, you know, the, the thing is, is that there are things that sometimes we just don't understand, but we still use them, we still accept them, we still appreciate them, we still realize that that's the truth. And it's the same thing with this. To... to you know, we're, we're no freer than when we surrender to the sovereignty of God. To ignore God's sovereignty to, is to exalt our responsibility and make man his own savior. And that's exactly what people do. Even Christians. But on the other side, to deny the responsibility is to make man a robot, unaccountable. We are accountable. And we're accountable not only before we get saved, but after we get saved. We also have that other tendency. We have that tendency to say, well, I'm saved now, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. But God is balanced. And it's a beautiful balance in God's Word. It exalts God and enables His people to live joyously and victoriously no matter what the circumstances might be. And I want to show you that in a couple of places in the Scriptures. First of all, turn with me to Acts in chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Now this is that early period of time <clears throat> after the Lord Jesus Christ had died and risen again and ascended to heaven. And uh, the believers are mostly basically in Jerusalem and the church is growing. Uh, and also as the church grows, so grows persecution. And uh, so... Uh, some of the disciples are called in before the government authorities and the Sanhedrin and all those people, and they're told, you're no longer to speak the name of Jesus Christ. You're not to talk about him. And then they're beaten and sent away. I always thought that was interesting. You know, they, they would beat them and then send them off. You know, if you're innocent, why are you getting beaten? But anyway, we come to verse 23. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported that 
all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. So when they had heard that, they raised their voices to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them who by the mouth of your servant David hath said, Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? This is, by the way, from uh, Psalm chapter uh, 2. The kings of the earth took their stand. The rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Do you understand what he's saying here? you understand what they're saying? They're saying, listen, these people did all these things to Jesus. But God was in control of the whole thing. This was God's plan. Now, you know, we, we know that it was a terrible thing that happened, and yet it was the greatest thing that happened. Verse 29, Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. By stretching out your hand to heal and the signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus and when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. And by the way, just let me add this here. Did you notice they were filled with the Spirit? They didn't speak in tongues. They were filled with boldness to speak the word of God. See, there are those who would say to us, uh, oh, every time they're filled with the Spirit, they spoke with tongues. No, it's not true. Now, Romans chapter 8. I'm not sure, but some may avoid some of this passage. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely giveth all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, and also makes intercession for us. Praise the Lord. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? It's a rhetorical question, isn't it? Can any of those things? No. As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And because God is sovereign, he can do as he pleases. And no one can hinder him, and no one can call him to account. You will hear people today, in the past, in the future, who are going to say, why did God do this, or why didn't God stop this? As if we know everything. <laughs> you know? 
Anybody know what's going to happen in the next second? My brother and I were just talking about, uh, he was down in Southern California holding evangelistic campaigns and, and uh, remember, because I mentioned I lived in 29 Palms, he mentioned when the earthquake hit there a number of years ago. When it hits, it, it doesn't come along and say, okay, we're coming. We're, we're, we're coming down the road, it's going to take place. I grew up with them. We just, as I told you, we, you know, we just kind of, you know, did this and that was life. But it would come a moment at a time. Now I know we have all the seismic things and stuff, but I grew up without that stuff. <coughs> now, Daniel chapter 4, verse 35 again says, All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? And then we're here back in Romans in chapter 9. Probably should have told you to hold on there. In verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to the Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. You remember the whole story about Pharaoh? You know, Moses comes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. And he said, I don't know who your God is. I'm not going to let your people go. Stop goofing around. Go back to work. That's, that's a modern translation. <laughs> and so they go back and, you know, they say, all right, this is going to happen. And the Bible says that, that, you know, his heart was hardened. And so Moses come back and said, let my people go. And No, I'm not going to let your people go. And so God's going to do this. And so God does it. So he calls them back, and this goes on for a few times, and he keeps on saying that Pharaoh hardens his heart. Pharaoh hardens his heart. Pharaoh hardens his heart. And then it says God hardens his heart. He kept on hardening his heart, and it's a sense God says, you're going to harden your heart? You haven't seen anything yet. I'm going to harden it. And it never as far as we know, gets soft again. Verse 19, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing form say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay? For the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor. What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he prepared beforehand for glory. In other words, God does these things for his glory, for his praise, not for ours. But everything he does is for his glory, including when he saves us. I, I think some people think when they get saved and then go like, wow, God should be so happy I got saved. <laughs> it 
We're saved for his glory. Do you realize the angels in heaven, when they see one of us get saved, they're just like, hallelujah. The heart of sinful man rebels at the very idea of a sovereign God. We want our, our, our hearts to be free of any outside control. And we, we see this in, in everything we do. Sinners, sinners think that they are free and don't realize how much they are in bondage. We're really in bondage when we're lost. And when we're in sin, we are in bondage. We're in bondage to our own sinful nature, to the forces of Satan in the world. You know, God is so wise and so powerful that he can ordain that his creatures have the freedom. Listen to me now. Let me start this again. God is so wise and powerful that he can ordain that his creatures have the freedom to make decisions and even disobey his revealed will. And yet he can accomplish his divine purpose on earth. Think about that. In other words, you go off you think it threw everything off. Mm -mm. He's still in control. Submitting to God's sovereign will didn't make Nebuchadnezzar any less of a man. In fact, this commitment transformed him from being a living beast to being a living human being. When he finally lifted his eyes up and he recognized who God was, he got his sanity back and he began to be not only who he was, but even greater. That's what's incredible. Verse 36. He goes on and he says, At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles resorted to me. I wonder when he, when he lost his mind, if, that, if, if for a few moments there or so, as he was charging out of his palace, if he was running past them, maybe even on all fours, and he saw their faces as they were going like, ah! and now all of a sudden they come back and they say, he's back. And what a different look was on their faces. He said, I was restored to my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added to me. Not just the glory that man gave him, God gave him majesty. He goes on, he says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. I know commentators, Bible scholars, all those we, 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 they, <laughs> we, we have different opinions about what really spiritually happened to him or not. I think he got saved. I think that he finally came to know the Lord and really put his faith in God and God alone. I really believe that's what happened. I believe that someday we're going to be walking through on the streets of gold and we're going to come across Nebuchadnezzar who's going to come out of his apartment, because it's not a mansion, but it's better than any mansion here. He's going to come out and we're going to say, Hallelujah! Nebuchadnezzar! And we'll actually be able to say his name. <laughs> I 
I mean, I've been telling it to you for a long time. We should have gotten it by now. And then he ends his statement to all the people of his realm with a warning. He says, and those who walk in pride he is able to put down. No one was prouder and had greater pride than Nebuchadnezzar. You know, the world doesn't think that pride is wicked and a dangerous sin. People today are all too often proud of what they've done. They also make a great deal about celebrities and athletes simply because they have accomplished something. I check at some time each time every day on, on the internet uh, briefly. <clears throat> I have over on the left hand side over here, and then uh, I might be checking something else. And what is it, Taylor Swift? <laughs> I shouldn't have, I mean. She's all over the thing. I mean, it's like worship. What did she do? One, all the money she makes and she can't even afford any clothing. <laughs> Poor dear thing. You should see them in Rodeo Drive. I mean, you know, they'll spend a thousand dollars for a pair of jeans that's got holes in them. I mean, you know, I, I could do you that for 500 at least. <laughs> but, but we worship these people. We exalt them. And really, it's not only their pride, but it's our pride. We're proud of all that. People look up to so-called successful people. If you've kept up with the news lately, and then a few years back, there's a man by the name of Epstein, extremely wealthy. Uh, I heard the other day how many places he had that he owned, huge, gigantic places. And, and we're all kind of scratching our heads. Why didn't all these other famous and wealthy and powerful people know? But they liked to rub shoulders with this guy. And he was depraved beyond belief. The, the evil things that this man was doing. And we don't even know if ever it will come out how many of these who liked to rub shoulders with him were doing the same kind of things. But that's a perfect example of where we're at as a society. A lot of these so-called successful people lack moral character. But if they're achievers, they get worldwide attention. The other day, I'm, I'm so old I get AARP magazines. They must be having trouble because I understand that they're giving them to younger and younger people now, you know, letting them know they can have them. But anyway, I, I thought the other day I got the magazine and I thought, Will they ever put on the front of this a normal, you know, just an average person? It's always celebrities. And then they have an article about them and it's so glowing and oh, you know, how wonderful and oh, and all this stuff. Uh, 
I'm sitting there going like, I'm sorry, I'm not impressed. Is there something wrong with me? And then I thought, well, the reason that they do that is because the readers love that. They love it. They're feeding them all this stuff. Well, one day, our Lord is going to come in judgment. And His promise is, in Isaiah 13, I will punish the world for its evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. I will halt the arrogance of the proud, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Jesus told the Pharisees in Matthew 23, Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And you know, Nebuchadnezzar didn't humble himself, God did. But finally, I think we could say he really did at the end. And God exalted him. But he gave him the greatest thing, and that was salvation. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the testimony of a great emperor, a mighty warrior, mighty general, uh, a mighty architect and builder and dreamer. Who had the incredible privilege of having your people in his kingdom. Having four of your finest godly men as part of his government of having a man like Daniel there by his side probably often and how you knew his heart and you worked in him in fact in such a way that we would hope we had never go through such a thing. But you did it all to bring him to know you. And we thank you. We thank you for his testimony. We thank you for his being willing. What a change we can see in his heart be, to be willing to send this document all over his empire to be read by everybody. And we praise you. And may we have the same kind of testimony to others that we come in contact with. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.